Hi, I'm Seema. Hi, I'm Cirilli. Today, I am so excited to have Dr. Nilu Tamala, who is an ENT surgeon and clinical assistant professor of surgery at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences, join us. She is a co-director of the Climate Health Institute at George Washington University and has a special interest in advocacy concerning the health effects of climate change. She is an avid writer and speaker on this issue as seen in various outlets, including the Washington Post, Newsweek, Scientific America, CNN, USA Today, The Hill, and NPR's Here and Now. She is a co-founder of Surgeons for Sustainable Future, for a Sustainable Future, and is a vice chair of public relations for Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action. She is a trained climate reality leader and works with the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health, the Union of Concerned Scientists, and Eco America as a volunteer activist and educator. Welcome, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Shmala. Thank you, Seema. Thank you, Sorelli. Really excited to be here to chat about climate and health. Well, we're excited to have you too. Thank you again for joining us, um, Dr. Tumala. So let's dive in. Can you tell us a little bit about the Climate Health Institute at GW? We understand it's brand new, and how it's working on your working with your colleagues to, has advanced the mission to promote equitable protection of population health, the local, national, and global levels. Definitely, yeah. So the Climate Health Institute is something that we just founded over the past couple of months at George Washington University. And the way that we're approaching this is really trying to create a cross-disciplinary approach to climate change and how climate change impacts health. And when I say this, I think a lot of times the health conversation tends to get siloed within the School of Medicine or within the School of Public Health. And what we're really trying to do here is integrate with our colleagues in the School of Business, School of Law, Economics, Media, to really bring the climate and health conversation forward. And so one of the really exciting things, and I was actually just on calls for two hours this morning, is that you know in our meetings, it's not just health professionals there, but we're hearing um, among um, a variety of individuals who are really able to bring their perspective on why, um, you know, energy conservation is important for health. And, um, and so we're really excited. We have a lot of, um, you know, new ideas for, for the new year. And um, the three pillars, you know, being uh, from a university that we're really focused on is education, research, and communication. And so we're really trying to take, um, you know, those three pillars and see what we can do um, as individuals who represent a lot of different um, schools of thought to, um, you know, move forward the conversation on climate change and health. And in terms of, you know, what will be our goal with equity, you know, I think we can all agree that no climate and health conversation is complete if we don't talk about environmental injustice. And so, again, when we think, um, consider our three pillars, education, research, and communication, it's really focusing on how um, we bring environmental injustice into those conversations. And so, for example, um, you know, our director, Stevenson Annenberg, is a public health researcher, and she's done a lot looking at air pollution and inequity. And um, you know, she has a, a study out looking at even um, inequity and air pollution for DC and the different uh, wards here. And so, really, you know, bringing those conversations to the forefront, um, talking about it. So, obviously, communication is a huge component of what we do. Uh, we just did a, um, a panel with second year medical students talking about climate change and health, but then also that the patients that they treat are oftentimes, um, you know, facing different sort of challenges when thinking about climate change. So you have some patients who um, from low income communities that may not have the adaptation strategies um, to adjust to extreme heat, or you may have um, some patients who um, are at higher risk for asthma and therefore may be more impacted by air pollution. So really just trying to, um, again, focus on environmental injustice and how that impacts health, but then bringing that to all of these different schools of thought um, in, the, uh, in the greater conversation. Thank you so much for sharing how the patient plays into that. 
So Nilu, can you break it down for us in terms of what is the most frequent climate caused health impact that you are seeing given you are a practicing physician? So as an ENT physician, the I would say the two most common things that I see would be my patients talking about how their pollen allergies are getting worse. And so because of climate change, um, pollen allergy seasons are, um, you know, on average about 20 days longer than they were 30 years ago. And there's about 21% more pollen in the air as compared to 30 years ago. And, you know, these um, changes are in part due to climate change and in part due to warming and um, plants being able to grow for a longer period of time during the year and then increase CO2 in the atmosphere and that just producing more pollen. Um, another thing that I see a lot is um, how air pollution impacts respiratory health. And so again, um, as someone who, you know, is really concerned about the upper airway, um, we oftentimes think about, okay, how do, how do um, our exposure risks um, in terms of different types of, you know, both indoor and outdoor air pollution, how does that impact our underlying uh, respiratory health? Although I will say one thing I feel like I'm seeing a lot, and this isn't specifically because I'm an ENT, but I do see more and more um, patients talking to me about um, their mental health concerns about uh, climate change. And, um, you know, I think this is something that, you know, on my bio for, um, for GW, it says that this is a topic I'm interested in. So I have a lot of patients who will, who will come in and um, they've read my bio. And so they'll talk to me about climate change and health. And um, increasingly, I see this um, growing awareness of uh, patients sort of admitting um, how concerned they are about this. And, um, and I think it's just one of those, as the conversation becomes more um, widespread and people feel more and more comfortable talking about it, they're really, um, you know, or well, maybe it's they're either more comfortable talking about it or they're just more concerned. And so the two are coinciding together where we're really, you know, there's just growing awareness of how large of a mental health issue um, climate changes as well. And that's not just from the climate impacts themselves, but also just what does climate change mean for our future, um, which, you know, is the eco-anxiety that's uh, related to this. I love that you touched on that and I, and, and that you're um, just in tune with your patients, listening to their um, concerns around eco-anxiety, climate anxiety, um, because they are seeing things happening around them and to themselves, or maybe even to their family members as well, that's climate related. Um, I wonder as a follow-up to that, I wonder where, where do you turn your patients to when, they, when they're seeking help or aid um, related to mental health and, and probably related to mental wellness? How do you maintain a level of, um, of positivity and optimism when we're constantly in an era where the narrative around climate change is gloom and doom. So where, where, do, you, where do you help patients get hope? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think that for everyone, the way that they think about climate change is a little bit different. And the way that I approach it is as long as I'm doing something, I feel positive that there's going to be um, maybe positive outcomes, the wrong word, but that we are making strides towards um, a more equitable and more sustainable future. And what I mean by that is, you know, I, I think that, you know, if there's something I'm worried about and I don't do anything about it, your worry escalates, right? But as soon as you start doing something, then, um, and it, when you're surrounded by people who are doing something as well, then you start to see, okay, change can happen. And for me, the way that I have, um, you know, maybe even the right word is treated, you know, any sort of potential eco-anxiety is by taking climate action. Um, and I sort of talk to my patients about similar ideas where it is about, you know, one, I think that something really impactful that patients can do is talking about their concerns. And so that's raising awareness. And even that, I tell them that's taking action. You know, that's something that Catherine Hayo has written a whole book about is the more we talk about it, the more people will know about it. And that's how we grow awareness and, um, and you know, basically get more and more people involved in the movement to push forward climate legislation. 
Um, and then I also, you know, will oftentimes talk to them about local organizations, so whether it's environmental organizations or health organizations that they can get involved with um, in order to, again, tell their stories or to um, get involved with the community to try to see what they can do on a more personal level. And um, it's, I think it's, um, everyone has sort of their own avenues for how they want to, to approach this. Um, but I think that the more that we sort of do um, either on an individual level or collectively, then the more um, impact we can have. And personally, that's, I think, the, uh, the best way to sort of treat this underlying anxiety. But also for some people, it's just talking about it. You know, it's like they come to the doctor, they want to talk about it. They uh, feel a little bit better that other people feel the same way. And I think there's value in that, too. And that's OK, um, you know, if it's um, that's where it gets uh, limited to. I think you're spot on. That's really helpful. The advocacy, taking charge, taking um, ownership of those feelings certainly is um, is really helpful. Offering connection points to organizations that are like minded or even in your community to develop that sense of social cohesion that often falls apart during or after even um, a climate disaster. So I definitely appreciate that. And I, you know, I will add that there is a national shortage on mental health providers. So if it goes beyond the anxiety, you know, and it is something that is categorized in DSM-5, then maybe there are more specific individual actions that, um, that we, and, and it sounds like you were doing, um, can help destigmatize because when people need help, they, should, um, they shouldn't feel like they are um, ashamed to seek it. And uh, then the other flip side of it is, you know, more of the policy level and um, maybe even healthcare systems level is offering more um, trained clinicians in the mental health services, um, you know, at the community level. So I appreciate that, thank you. Yeah. Did you have a question? You Sorry, I just want to say, it's really, you're totally right, right? Like some people, it may not, um, I don't want to undermine that just doing advocacy work is enough to address eco-anxiety. Um, of course, if you need like, you know, more expert um, help, then that um, should be available as well. Yes, thank you. You know, unfortunately, I do think that this is going to continue to be a reality. And, um, you know, just one more piece that I found recently interesting um, was the Surgeon General when talking about mental health recently for school-age children and how climate change was coming up as a key issue for, for school-age children and anxiety. So um, it will be interesting to see how we can rise to this challenge together. Um, and you know, thinking about rising to that challenge, I'd love to learn about what that pathway looked like for you, your personal journey from being a physician to being a physician climate activist. Yeah, that's a, you know, it feels like a, both a long and a short journey at the same time. I'm sure both of you feel somewhat similar. Um, you know, when I was um, a medical student and in training, I don't know that I ever really thought that being a climate health advocate is going to be something that I was going to spend a lot of time on in the future. Um, I knew that climate change was something I was interested in, and I knew that I was going to be treated patients, treating patients, but the two together um, wasn't something I had really considered until um, about three or four years ago when I was at a conference and was learning about all of the different health impacts of climate change. And what was you know, kind of funny about that conference is I remember sitting in this group and um, I was around all these incredible environmental advocates. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing here. Like, I know I want to be here and I know I want to learn more about climate change, but I kind of felt like I was taking up someone's spot, you know, of, of someone who was potentially, um, you know, could be more impactful in the climate movement. And, um, and then when I started hearing about all these health impacts and, um, and I'll just a little sidebar, uh, most medical schools, at least when I was in medical school, did not teach anything about climate change and health. That's a change in conversation now, which is incredible. At GW, we have started um, lectures for the first and second year medical students about climate change and health. So um, just to, to give a little bit of background information, it wasn't something I had um, traditionally been trained in, in terms of um, knowing or having that awareness of how climate change impacts health. So, um, so I'm sitting at this conference, I'm hearing about all of this, and I was like, I have to learn more. And so, um, you know, uh, the nice thing is that there's been more and more research about how um, climate change impacts health. So it was actually 
quite easy to be able to go online and read about like an array of, um, you know, ways that like, you know, air pollution impacts cardiovascular health um, or how um, elderly people are more um, at risk for heat stress or to read about the pollen allergies. Like basically each of these things that I heard about, I was able to like find really substantial scientific data to support all of the different intersections of climate change and health. And so I would say I spent at least the first like year or so really educating myself because basically I was learning a new topic of medicine. um, And I took some online courses through Yale. I did one of Michael Mann's um, climate science courses to be able to learn more about the science behind climate change. So a lot of that was just sort of self-education. And then from there, um, it sort of propelled into, okay, as a health professional, um, what can I do to influence this conversation in terms of helping people raise awareness? And so the way that I consider my role is I don't want to alarm people that the environment that they live in is really unhealthy, um, but I do want people to be informed about their environmental hazards and, you know, the importance of making our environment healthier um, to um, improve the health of future future generations. And so it's all about like an awareness and there's a ton of people who just don't know about this. And um, and I can't say that I'm surprised because as a healthcare professional, I didn't even know about this until four years ago. And so, um, you know, every time I talk to someone who doesn't, I'm like, this is something we need to be talking about more. We need to, to really ra- raise more awareness of. And so, um, that has just sort of been like a gentle evolution over the past couple of years. A lot of it's been um, being experimental with communication and education, getting involved with health and environmental organizations. Um, So I'm a part of Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action. Um, And then we also, of course, just started the Climate Health Institute. There's there's a big medical society consortium on climate and health. And so all of that kind of helped me see what other healthcare professionals are already doing in this space and then sort of creating a space for my own. Um, But one thing I I learned along the way that I hadn't anticipated initially, but actually learned this um, very early on, and it's really, it's something that you had mentioned about, like, you know, when I see the mental health concerns of my patients, um, I started to see the impacts of climate change in my patients. And I realized that I needed to be one of the voices that was highlighting their concerns, because a lot of times they may not have the opportunity or even realize sort of that the environment that they're living in is negatively impacting their health. But then when they come to the clinician's office and we start hearing about the things that they're exposed to and then their symptoms that they're having, then um, it's a lot easier for us to kind of put those pieces together and say, okay, like, you know, you live near the highway, you're exposed to this like higher level of air pollution, this is negatively impacting your child's asthma. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about um, you know, the health harms of air pollution, and then maybe even take that conversation further and talk about how, um, you know, racism has contributed to, um, you know, racist housing practices and, you know, and, you know, try to create that bigger conversation to help people understand, um, again, why, um, you know, learning about the environment that they live in is so important for improving um, community health. Because again, the more people that we have talking about this, the more impact that we can make um, as a community. I love that. I love how you're ending on the note of community because, you know, somebody really smart said this, so don't quote me on it, but we can't be healthy people on a sick planet. And, And that means, you know, the entire planet, but also at the community level, because there are systems and structures put into place that have intentionally in some cases and unintentionally in others, Um, made certain places more healthy to live in. And I love the connection point that you're making and that you're calling out to other health professionals through, um, you know, our viewers that, you know, everyone has kind of a a perspective, um, a lens into this conversation. So with that, I can't thank you enough for sharing all that you're doing. And maybe um, in a couple months or a year's time, you'll come back and join us and tell us how the Institute is evolving. And we'd love to follow up with you. Um, Until then, um, thank you to our listeners as well for following us. And we hope this conversation has been um, inspirational to you as much as it has been to us. Thank you, thank you so much, so much Nilu. Nilu. Yeah, and thank you, Seema. This has been great. And I really appreciate the work that both of you do um, in terms of talking about climate and health and uh, raising awareness. Until next time, let's all make some noise for climate. Sounds good.